All right, I think, I think we're ready for, for the third session um, and then concluding remarks. Um, so the third session, um, sort of a main topic is labor, but as I explained, um, this is through the lens of uh, um, practicing. Um, what does it mean practice today? Um, and also the question of uh, labor equity and climate are intertwined, so feel free to ask questions that pertains to all these three topics to the presenter of, the, um, of, of this afternoon session. So I have uh, the pleasure to introduce um, three speakers, um, Amelin Eng, um, she is a Singaporean Australian architect and cartoonist, um, a graduate of uh, CCCP program at Columbia University um, School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Um, Ameling's research led practice um, explores architecture as media, as environmental matter, and as the representation of uh, spatial information. Ameling's ongoing work revolves around um, building information modeling and the entanglement of drawing with labor and material system. She is an assistant professor at RISD. Um, we have uh, Nicholas McDermott, um, co-founder of Future Expansion. Um, Future Expansion is a Brooklyn-based firm uh, with a, an enthusiastic uh, attitude for the creation of new architectural and, and urban possibilities and a desire to generate a new body of work for and from a changing city. Uh, Nicholas is a registered architect in New York State, um, is a lead accredited professional and serves on the board of directors of the Design Advocates. Uh, he also teaches at the Yale School of Architecture. Um, future Expansion is, um, a, uh, is led by uh, himself, Nicholas, and also uh, his partner, Deirdre uh, McDermott. Um, and then, um, Office of Things, um, Ken Bulbui and um, Lane Brick. Um, Office of Things is a practice with five partners in three different locations. New York, Charlottesville, and Chicago. Their work explore the construction and transformation of the built environment by integrating artful gestures into everyday spaces. They aim to bring a sense of place and community to their work. Uh, Lane Brick is a registered architect in New York um, and Georgia. She supports her work through research, writing, and drawing, exploring issues of urbanism, authenticity, and the interaction between people and the environment. She teaches at the um, Spitzer um, uh, School of Architecture. Um, and Ken is a registered architect in New York. Um, prior to, um, pri prior to uh, uh, founding Office of Things, he worked at Johnson Shoe uh, in Toronto, uh, Peter Eisman, and uh, seven years as a project architect at AJ Associate. Um, he also um, is in academia and teaches at Yale um, School of Architecture. So I um, I'm happy to have Emeling, uh, Emeling uh, as the first presenter. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, nice to be here. I'm, um, as you can tell, I don't have uh, an immediate practice uh, name or a kind of uh, LLC structure of that kind. I'm mostly a research-based practice and um, I am a licensed architect in the state of Victoria in Australia. Um, and currently my obsessions have been around um, acts of specification. So I think instead of showing like the tile of work that I've done, I think it's more a deep dive, the six minutes that I have uh, into um, two exhibition projects of late. This one is uh, Planetary Home Improvement, 
It's a project that was installed in Prague in the Czech Republic during Omicron. So uh, it was an interesting time, but I think I was and am still kind of asking about not just the forms of architecture, but the, the kind of tools and methods with which we specify architecture um, and how material uh, and data might, might coincide or come together to kind of produce maybe alternative understandings of like where design might live, um, whether it's looking a bit upstream or downstream um, in systems and infrastructures we're kind of imbricated in. So this, this kind of, this project, uh, I might kind of flip through here, is um, a kind of digital and physical depot. Um, I, uh, along with uh, two of my collaborators, um, Gabriel Vegar and Christine Giorgio, also we met at GSAP, um, were really interested in this idea of materials being geological and actually this idea that actually an architectural in intervention is, is, is touching on like millions of years of, of life formation. So if you think about buying a steel stud from Home Depot, you, you're actually, you know, tapping into the Archean era. It was kind of a way of, of taking ourselves a little bit out of the supply, just in time, demand, uh, supply and demand of materials that we, you know, often have the consumer relationship with our materials when we go to Home Depot as consumers or when we specify um, materials as, as architects. So um, the, the big thing of this exhibition was really to create a website that scrolled backwards. This is a fast, you can still log on to it. It's still, um, it's um, uh, iPhone friendly or phone friendly, I should say. But uh, it does um, make the shopper go backwards in this consumer interface. Uh, and you can kind of like grasp at these objects and click on them. And sometimes they will, they will have specifications that tell you something else about the materials and how they have been extracted and so on. Um, the QR codes in the gallery uh, were uh, affixed. Also, they linked to this website, but they were, um, um, affixed to materials that we found on, in construction sites in Prague. And this is something that, um, as a practice, I hope to continue working with. It's like a nebulous um, space of, I guess, contingency with salvage and um, materials that you may find short in supply um, or kind of crop up occasionally in abundance. Um, these were drawings that we produced for the exhibition and um, there's something about, I think, this, this kind of sectional understanding of extraction. Um, you know, Bruno Latour talks about critical zones and like actually all the intervention that we're doing is really like within the, you know, few kilometers above and below the ground's crust. And so where are our products coming from? What are the kind of acts on this kind of planetary scale, I guess, that, um, that architects feel maybe sometimes a bit, uh, detached from or disengaged from because they're too far upstream or like questions of waste, for example, or too far downstream for us to think about meaningfully. Um, so we decided to step back and kind of really delve in uh, to, you know, metals, plastics, uh, rocks and wood. Um, there were transducers affixed to these drawings so you could kind of even listen to the sonic, um, they, 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 they turned the materials which the drawings were mounted onto, you know, plywood, polycarbonate and so on. So you could listen through using them as speakers to the sounds of extractive um, and also just like the creaks of the earth, I guess, if, if you. Um, so it was kind of a playful, I, I guess, approach to this question of entanglement with material life. Um, this project I did want to spend a bit more time on because it's been top of mind. It's a project that uh, was just exhibited in uh, RISD architecture in the, in the kind of main gallery we have uh, in September. It's called Depot. Uh, there's also a website that still exists, so you can forage through that. Um, the subtitle is called Gross Domestic Practices, and I think maybe this is something I want to, yeah, maybe have a chat with, with everybody else about what practices might mean as a verb form as opposed to a noun form, like a firm, this idea of a structure, what, um, what salvage practices in this case uh, bring to architecture as a material economy is like a space of action. Um, so anyway, this project is kind of, you know, 3D scans of all these samples that we brought into the gallery um, and staged as bays as well. It's kind of a follow on from the previous 
um, exhibition, but this time really engaging with New England's supply chain. And by supply chain, we don't mean like global networks of, of um, you know, materials being transported, but uh, scrap yards and uh, local uh, material reuse centers in New England, um, hardware, um, wood, and um, uh, dust, which I'll get to, but this is a web map that also still exists. You can click on it, and the idea is what does it mean to supply, like what does it mean to have suppliers or think about the supplier? And we often think that, you know, I don't know if architects are like have the, the most novel thoughts about these things, but really like salvage has been going on for ever, and it's a huge, it's like a, a really energetic industry of materials. So. Um, we visited a bunch of um, practitioners, I should say, working in um, antique wood salvage, recovery of barns, deconstruction, and um, other depots that existed with, uh, within the New England region, also New York. Um, it's fascinating spaces. We started to draw them and interview the people who run them. Um, a lot of them are passion projects, like the granite broker in Connecticut right, for, to, to this like salvage wood broker out of a rental barn also in Connecticut, um, to Providence Library of Things and Boston Building Resources who are um, cooperative um, organizations to the Soil Bank in New York, which is very exciting for us. Um, so these are some images of like our site visits and I think just by stepping out of the project mode, we were, we were trying to work on this for a year, just really unraveling what it meant to exist uh, or witness existing within this economy of, of move, like material movement, let's say. Um, and we started making these artifacts that um, were reclaiming and taking on some of these materials, um, soil bricks, thinking about adobe, thinking about depaving, uh, and thinking also about impervious surfaces and how we could uh, undo them kind of materially as well. Um, so of course they came with drawings. Uh, I think this was like really an exploration of specification and organization and how architects, I think it was a conversation about file formats earlier or something and, and naming. And I, that's something I get obsessed about as well. Um, but even using, for example, like, see it like off, like, um, uh, actually maybe I'll, I might show it in a bit, um, uh, open source software like OpenNest to nest other things rather than just CNC fabrication um, uh, sheets. So this was a kind of, I guess, moment for us where we wanted to practice in, in the salvage space as well and like what it meant to labor with the materials, to store them in various corners of the school and our house, um, which is not ideal, but it's kind of like living with a lot of this contingency of material. It's kind of a detail of the shelf unit in the exhibition, which also used scrap wood uh, as part of the kind of shadow line joint. Um, and we did a lot of biomaterial testing to really, um, yeah, interrogate what it meant, I guess, at, even at a prototypical level to be engaged with the waste ourselves. Um, that's something that I think is new for, for me in my practice um, that has been so reliant on representation and drawing and thinking about systems and infrastructures through drawing that actually cooking up some of this stuff in my kitchen with like brick dust and sawdust that we had sourced from shops and so on in New Bedford and in Providence uh, really kind of brought home how much labor it took, but also like um, how exciting uh, a lot of these things are when you kind of think of material, like something as non-structural and supposedly useless as dust as potentially something to recoup and reimagine alongside other um, more unit uh, standardized materials. Um, it looks like I will not go back to that slide, so I, I will do this and just say that these drawings were a part of a larger question for, I guess, the modes of representation we do today where you know, photogrammetry, scanning have crept into our lives. And um, as a cartoonist, I also try to put forward other narratives that are not just like um, technocratic and kind of thinking about do-it-yourself videos, you know, uh, that, that show labor, that show hands, um, working with materials, you know, in some cases sawdust can be used as gap fillers, uh, as repair substrate. Um, so thinking about like knowledge, where knowledge comes from as well, and maybe thinking about, um, yeah, um, ways in which they're actually incredibly mundane and 
uh, um, time-consuming spaces just spent cleaning and uh, recording materials. Um, anyway, so just to wrap up, um, on the side, I, I am still kind of keeping up with uh, more of an academic context uh, practice, like research, writing, uh, organizing forums, and, and um, more representation-based work. And this is a recent one called Planetary uh, Accounting, seen from a warehouse, and it's a scene from Revit. Uh, it's trying to think about Revit as a Craigslist or Revit as a <laughs> space of salvage. Like, what does it mean to communalize something as dry as BIM to think about inventory um, differently and acts of maybe counter inventorying? Uh, and this is just a throwaway slide to say that I, I can't help but uh, just kind of go into my cartooning corner and. and that's in a way, it's like kind of, it's like kind of adjacent to the, the kind of architecture practice that I do, but it's also, I think, a good way to talk about narratives and ways in which that, you know, even work that isn't teleologically tooled into a project might help you um, reflect back on what it is that you care about uh, as you carve out something as, as nascent as like a expanded practice. So uh, yeah, that's it, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Nick McDermott, um, co-founder of Future Expansion Architects. Um, we're in the Gowanus neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, as Alessandro said, I founded the office with my wife um, and business partner, Deirdre McDermott. Um, and very excited to be here in conversation with everyone today. Um, everyone on this panel I admire. Um, and I'm thrilled that there's a kind of chance to put a, a lot of these projects together on the wall um, and sort of see what happens in the, in, in the kind of conversations that we're, um, that are following on. So um, for my part, um, we're in our office, which is now about 10 years on, um, we're, we're working in many ways and in thinking about the um, question of labor um, specifically, which was um, the heading of this portion of the panel, um, I, I, it made me reflect back on the kind of many forms of labor that do go into our projects, um, from things like um, the, this project, which was um, commissioned by the Van Allen Institute um, in 2017-18, which is a you know, public art, temporary public art installation, but the kind of labor that goes into a project like this, which is fabrication-based, which means working very closely with a shop of highly skilled people um, on a project with in kind of incredible constraints around budget, around the kinds of things you can do in public. Um, and that, that's, that's one form of labor, you know, the kind of design and the, and the building and installation of something like this happens with a kind of certain set of people. Um, for a project like this, which um, was completed in you know, 2021, 2022 um, in Brooklyn, this was an addition to a church in the Park Slope neighborhood. Um, the, the kind of form of the project, and including the forms of labor that go into a project like this, are totally different than the kinds that go into that sort of public art installation, working with a general contractor, right, who has subcontractors, we have consultants, um, the web of labor is very different and impersonal in comparison in certain ways to that in sort of intense um, fabrication effort of, a, of like the previous project um, where decisions are being made, um, you know, in, in a, we, we come, we see a mock-up, we touch things, we adjust things, we decide in, the, in this last one, for example, um, uh, th these are cardboard tubes, they were wrapped in this film to make them look like steel tubes. We wanted to be able to unwrap them and, and recycle the cardboard in the end. Um, but the, you know, just things like the, the waterproofing of that, like rubbing different surf waxes across these things, um, you know, it's very different than something like this, which has to last a lot longer and where surf wax is not appropriate um, material specification. Um, but you know, this, so this project was, f the, the client asked for a, 
they just needed to make the church accessible. Um, and so they had done a they had done a study prior to our involvement where they they decided to put the the, the um, el- just an elevator in the back of the church. Um, we can we we talked to them and getting to know them, getting to know the kind of church community, realized that the part of the problem was the the way that the old entrance worked. It was on the corner. They had no access to this garden that was next to them. And so we we drew up a plan and convinced them that the proper location so that. Um, People who needed wheelchair access weren't entering the back, the exact opposite side of the church than everyone else, um, that, and, and that no one really had accessible access to the garden, that, that this was the right spot. You could come in from the sidewalk and move. It made the project three times as expensive, but one of the things um, that we were able to do was to um, help them raise the money to fill that funding gap, and so we developed drawings and models, took them to the bishop of the, Me- of the Methodist church um, and, and got as well as others and got a few grants and, and this was then kind of fully funded. Um, but w- what um, the, the project I'm gonna dwell a little bit longer on today um, is a project outside of the city, um, but one that touches on labor in a way, lab- kind of puts, let's say labor and our, our own offices sort of environmental thinking um, together in a way that I think may be appropriate um, for the kind of topics of the panel. Um, but to, to start, when, when, we're th- when we're thinking this, this project, which takes place um, on the, in the Delaware River, um, two and a half hours outside of New York on the border of Pennsylvania, um, and it's in an it's a existing working farm, um, and so m- many of the things that we were thinking about um, were, um, as we went into this project, were, I've had a kind of long interest in the American Granger movement, which um, from a kind of labor point of view is in, in incredibly fascinating, but it's really the moment in this, after the Civil War when the, um, the um, industrial agriculture was getting started and it was facilitated by trains because you could move, you could move um, agricultural products across the country. You didn't have to worry about spoilage as much. Refrigeration was starting to happen um, and small farmers were getting screwed um, because the, kind of these kind of um, industrial conglomerates were starting to set the prices. And so the Grangers joined together. They essentially formed national movement in order to form local cooperatives and they build little Grange halls and so it was a kind of it was a cooperative with a spatial dimension in the sense that they all met they all had these kind of community meetings they 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 would do things like buy one tractor to share all this began happening because in response to uh, sort of forces that they coun't control but at the community level began to wrest control for themselves so this is for me very inspiring in the light that it has a kind of spatial and architectural um, outcome, um, and then Wendell Berry, who's a, um, a kind of incredible writer who uh, it writes about these issues of, um, of environment, um, racism, and um, and industrial agriculture in the '60s, um, and really finds in it a lot of it an answer. The answer for him very much is about labor and about our the the ways in which um, Americans had been separated from the kind of fundamental acts of labor that support their own lives. So, um, and then the, the final thing on this slide is this poster from Design Advocates, um, a, jur- a journal that we produced as a group um, in 2021. Um, and this essay on the bottom is, is called Empowered Structures um, that I wrote. Um, but it kind of talks about the kind of genesis of the group, um, Design Advocates and Our Goals, but um, very much design advocates was about trying to find other ways, accepting that we all worked in our own small offices, but trying to find productive ways to come together, to work together, to um, achieve things at scales that one can't do in those small offices. So to both say the small office is a kind of wonderful thing with a lot to offer, but that it can gain a lot when we come together. And um, listening to the last presentation, one of the things that reminded me of, and one of the things that I'm very excited about design advocates is we're always specifying, we think of specification as something that happens with materials, but we're, we have a, we, we've been fantasizing about, well, now that there's a group of us, what if we started writing labor specifications? What if we wrote into our contracts? How, how could we use essentially the tools, the instruments of service to specify other things, to do other things? How can you write things into contracts? There's no reason you cannot specify labor conditions. Right? It's totally possible. One could do this. No one does it. I, I've never heard of that happening, but it, it, it could totally be done. Um, and so that's the kind of things that through something like Design Advocates, we're able to sort of have those discussions. How should you implement that? How should that language work its way into a contract? Um, so I think these are, um, for me, very exciting topics. So, oops, 
Um, okay, so the project that in, in Delaware County on the De or, the De or on the Delaware River um, is it's a, it's a working farm. Um, it's located. The farm is here. Um, our client, however, is not a farmer. Um, he had bought this farmhouse and just a little property around it 20 years ago. Um, and slowly, as the farms around him failed, he, he continued to buy land, eventually subsuming the land that the active farmer is on. Um, and still, and to this day, the, the farmer, so the deal was kind of like, okay, you can, the, the farmer, Herm, Herm, this is his farm, um, he can farm all this land that was being agglomerated by our client, and the client gets the kind of incentive of, he, then the land is agricultural land, so he pays less taxes, because it's agricultural land. So it's a kind of win-win, and Herm doesn't pay any rent. So, um, the, but when we started working on this project, the question was, what do I do with this land? I've sort of accidentally um, found myself owning 400 acres. Um, it's not a rich person. The land price is insanely low as to the farms that I own. Um, and so the, we, we were working with the client to try to figure out what to do with the land. Um, so our first thing was like, well, what is 400 acres? We're city people. We do not understand. We do not measure things in acres. Um, so we, 400 acres, you know, it's a, fa it's a working farm with pastures and woods. Um, it supports currently um, one working farm and two homes. In New York City, in our neighborhood, in the Gowanus Canal, that's, that same amount houses 4,300 homes um, at, at about um, 57 people per acre. So you can do the math that there's a lot more than um, the five people who are living on the land right now. At the same time, the zoning, the rural zoning would allow you to subdivide this land and build 125 homes on two acre properties. That's perfectly legal. And that's not only perfectly legal, that's what happens. That's what the strategy is. When you've ac accidentally accumulated 400 acres, you die, you sell, your heirs sell it because they have to pay the taxes to, um, to developers and they cut it up and they do that. Um, but we don't like that outcome. Um, and so what we've, been done, what we've already done with the client is um, we, we use a legal mechanism called a conservation easement. It's too detailed to go into how it works, but essentially what we've done is in perpetuity, forever, traded the rights to develop the land like that and carved out seven pieces that can be developed in exchange. The land is massively devalued and there's no tax burden when it gets passed on eventually because if it's, it's, it's not valuable, you can't do that anymore, it has no value. Um, so what we did is we, um, this, is the, this is the property. So this is the scheme with, with the two of those seven are the farm um, and the old farmhouse and the other five will be developed. And our idea um, is, in working with the client, was to import a, a model from or from that we know from New York City um, to this place, which is the um, cooperative, like the like you buy a cooperative apartment building. So what we're doing is we're just building five little tiny houses, and um, we're developing it, and we'll sell shares in the land, like a co-op, like just like you would do in a co-op. It's the sa same thing. And so what you get from that is you get your house, but you also have rights to use all of the land your own, essentially just in the same way I can use my cooperative apartment, the backyard, I can use the lobby. But here what you get to use is a pond and a forest and a field. The farmer will get a free, become a shareholder too in this cooperative and continue to manage, the, continue to farm the land for free. And so this is a, this is like a kind of win, win, win. The real estate taxes stay low, there's no tax burden to the IRS, and then the farmer um, is, it becomes a kind of land manager in a way, right? There's a value to the management of the land that the farmer does, that is a value that the real estate system, we think, could support in a way that the agricultural system no longer supports small far dairy farmers. So we're gonna, we're just gonna tucking these things in. The, the final aspect I'll mention is the red dot um, to this kind of idea of community building. Our, our idea is that we'd like this to be a model, the client would want this to be a model. It doesn't matter to save 400 acres, what we need to do is save a lot more acres than that. So we're, um, we're developing a series of public, this is why it's called and this other one says, um, we're all pops, privately owned public space. The idea is um, that the red dots become community facilities that anyone can use. Um, and so we invite you know, hunters and swimmers and hikers. We're working with the Trust for Public Land to connect the tr into another trail system that exists. Um, and because we think that um, on only through people caring about something does the thing get saved, does the project become successful. So to do that, our first thing that we built we finished um, this year is this, um, you can sort of see the pond back there. We built this building, which is a sauna. 
um, a wood-fired sauna, a composting toilet, um, a shade structure, because this is literally in a cow pasture. It's very, very hot. Um, and then this pond. Um, and so anyone can use this. It's just a community thing that we built. Um, now this comes down, the, the labor question for us here was that um, we wanted this to be buildable by um, a, someone local. So we literally found a, a guy down the street um, who was just started his contracting office and his, uh, his only credential was that he had built a deck for our client, so our client knew him. He was like, he's the, he's the son of the guy who runs the tractor store. Um, so we thought, oh, this will be great. He's got a family, he's local, like we, he wants to be a contractor. We can work, we could help set him up in this community by giving him work, you know, the work that will happen. So we, this, the other, the kind of secret objective of this sauna was also to train him to build a house. You know, without screwing up a house, he can screw this up, he's okay. Um, and we built it with the hemlock, local hemlock that's milled in the mill that's a mile away. Um, and um, ag this is just agricultural fabric tied on with bungee cords. Uh, welded, steel welded by the guy who fixes all the tractors locally. Um, and so the, the theory was sort of like this idea that like, that there might be these kind of ripple effects if you can think about through the lens of labor and material, um, but that you have to then, you have to, if you're thinking about labor and material, yeah, that, that implies thinking about the shape and the framing of the house, like you have to do things that can be done with this labor pool. The labor is, they're not skilled, they're not that skilled. Um, and so. How, do, how could these things ripple out was kind of the question. Um, and so we have this idea, we're, we're always talking about like tolerance in the office, like um, if you specify something with, that is impossible tolerance, in my mind that's like not a detail. You, all you've said is, um, we don't have time for a detail, you just have to get it perfect, just do it perfect. Um, that seems so unfair to people in the field. So, um, so, we had, so one of our first pitches was, okay, what if we have something like this, a glass house with standard size windows and reasonable tolerances? Like that's our design objective. Um, and it can have things like a kind of community um, roof that's a public space, things like that. Um, and so that's what we're doing, um, but uh, the, p the plan changed a little, so it's, a, it's an 800 square foot house. We built this model because the framers had no idea, they'd never done anything like this before. So you can see they have the model on site. There was a framing model to show them how to do it. They were like so happy to get their model because they did not understand the plan. So this is the house that's under construction now. Um, that's it from earlier this week. Um, it has this, you can see it has this, the roof deck. It's just a one story house, but there's a staircase that takes you to the roof deck because it's got the best sunset on the property. So that's just the kind of public space. The trail goes to the roof and you can, anyone can use the roof deck. Um, and this is the little house, just a one bedroom with a kind of living, it's just two, and uh, you know, two squares. Like the idea is like, what could be simpler than building a square? You build a square um, and we'll just, every house will just be squares, different combinations of squares. Um, and then, so I'm gonna end just with this project very quickly. Um, uh, this is something else we're doing in the office. Like I, I think, like l the idea of like us as architects and being able to look at the city is so important, and not to accept the narratives that kind of come to us. So, um, we did this during the pandemic. We drew these six bro blocks in Brooklyn, and they're each different housing types. So one is the Clinton Hill co-ops. One is the parts is a part typical Park Slope block. One is Williamsburg New Construction, um, the apartment buildings that I lived in in South Brooklyn, uh, which are co-ops. Um, kind of these H-shaped co-ops, high-rise public housing, and then low-rise public housing. And what we were interested in was like, all we're always told like Park Slope is a kind of urban paradise in a way. What we found when you look at the data is that Park Slope has by far the lowest density of any of these blocks. Um, Park Slope, you would have to double the residential on this to get to the medium density of these other blocks, of the medium density of the six blocks, and it has no public green space. So part of our, one, our curiosity is like, given that, and given that the, the communities need green space and density, why do we think of that as a great urban block? Like, why do we think of something like bushless houses, um, which are public housing, high rise towers, why do we think of that as so bad? They're very dense and they have essentially a public park. Um, and we compared this to the Clinton Hill co-ops, which are the exact same building form. So people are always like, yeah, but they're just such ugly buildings. You know, it's, they're terrible. Like the Clinton Hill co-ops, which are the exact same building form, are incredibly valuable, you know, they're, they're in a great neighborhood, but they're a wonderful, 
they're wonderful buildings. Um, they also are entered off the street. You know, you have to go into internal courtyard just like you do with these. And the value of those um, is incredibly high and it's well acknowledged. This is considered a blight that must be fixed. Um, and that's, uh, that doesn't make, to me that makes no sense. It's like, this seems to be solving two of the city's objectives. Um, this solves one. Um, what's, what's wrong with this? Um, and so we're, in our own work, this is just the final slide. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about these things. This is the building we're building. It's not done yet. This is Kent Beezer shot of a 67 unit apartment building in Queens. Um, but trying to bring in some of these ideas of thinking at the scale of the block, it's too, it's not a full block at all, but it's two properties and it touches two streets. So we're able to get the, con the client to build this commercial outdoor space in the back that could host things like food trucks. It's just essentially, we came in from just to put the parking underground instead of on this deck um, and to leave the deck open as a kind of commercial space. So it's a kind of small gesture in a way, but the, um, it was just this, there's this thought that just like with design advocates, maybe working at a bigger scale is good. Working, thinking at the scale of the block suddenly seemed to me to unlock a lot of potential rather than just the scale of the building. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for inviting us. Uh, we admire so many of the people who are speaking here today, or have spoken here today, so we're <coughs> totally honored and humbled to be here to discuss kind of our office a little bit. Uh, my name is Ken, and this is Lane. Uh, we're two members of Office of Things, and perhaps in light of like today's conversation, especially with this afternoon's session about labor and practice, uh, I'd like to return to a word that's been used a few times, uh, collective. Uh, I think Nick brought it up in the type of works they like to do, um, and Lucy as well as Bryony in, in the work that she does with her with her other uh, colleagues. Um, and I'd maybe offer an alternate reading to that word, and not to devalue any of those other versions, but our own version is slightly different. Um, at Office of Things, we believe in uh, a collective power to learn, uh, to share, um, and also to kind of expand our resources our labor, our skill set, our knowledge, um, and that each project can continually reinvent this organizational structure that you know, we've started to develop. Um, so like briefly, there's five of us, um, and we started off as friends, went to grad school, architects, um, you know, all went to do the thing, we all worked at offices. Um, and you know, over time we became united in this idea that as a collective, uh, we could share in our experiences, uh, discuss questions of practice, uh, take on challenges of details, like all these different scales of what we do in our practices that we were working at, uh, but use each other as a resource for solutions. And we started to think that like, why couldn't we use that on our own a little bit instead of like reapplying it to our respective offices? Um, and that these questions that we tackled could be tackled by ourselves and potentially into projects of our own making. So, you know, very early on, we decided that, you know, having four other people with you uh, gave us this large shared pool of these resources. And what, one of the things that's happened over time is like we've grown and changed. And this flexibility, I think, is one of the things that has been touched on a couple of times over the course of today, like being small, has its drawbacks, but one of the benefits is that you are more nimble and you're able to think about atypical project configurations, atypical kinds of things that you define as projects and so on. And so over time, really what we've worked to do is to expand this network beyond just five of us, but to include fabricators, artists, builders, contractors, programmers, friends, other architects. Um, and so each project itself takes on a different path. It has different needs. It needs different people, even from one phase to the next. And so for us, this is a collective that allows us to be at once small and also big. And this allows us to kind of have a safety net for when we don't know the answer, which is often, um, but also to take on 
these are very varied prep kinds of projects. And so one of the things we wanted to do today is to walk through a couple of projects and think about them through the lens of how we build the team that makes them. Yeah, and each of the projects kind of take on a different capacity in that kind of reinvention of the plan. Um, so the first one is a series of projects, actually. It's a, an immersive a series of immersive spaces um, that are each carved into existing buildings. Um, and the goal is really to create these small spaces for a respite, for escape, for meditation, um, for kind of focus on yourself inward and also kind of outward, creating a space where you can do both at the same time. And one of the things that's been interesting about those is that they take all of these larger questions. You know, it's the, each one requires a huge team of, and like a process of coordination to get to. You need to have the drawings, but you also need to have the programmer. You also need to have the music composed, and you also have the, to have someone who installed the LEDs and the lights, and you have to have someone to build the millwork and like build the walls and all this stuff. And so there's like this very interesting confluence of many, many different fields and practices, and it's the coordination, the navigation of that that is something that's been really interesting about that process for us. Um, in these cases, you know, we're still working through these ideas and testing what each iteration is and watching the idea grow within it. Um, but we also like to work with other architects and artists. And so this is a recent installation that um, in Chicago where um, we worked, Vincent ran, so we have kind of like different leaders for different projects. Vincent read, led this project because he's in Chicago. He worked with a local artist, Akima Brakim. Um, they both teach in Chicago, and then they worked with a client, uh, I am able. And so the three of the, these three stakeholders together come together to build this design and to, to like actually fabricate the, um, the pavilion, and then also to come up with the way that it carries on in its life. I think we talked a little bit about what happens after this, after the, after the festival of the, um, that the, pavil that the pavilion was at, then it has to be dismantled and then it goes to the client's um, courtyard as its second life and so it can live there in eternity. And so this is an opportunity where the client begin, begins to be a stakeholder and begins to like, start, help, start to help design this. Um, and then kind of moving towards the other direction, like some projects don't necessarily need collaboration. And sometimes it's important to be able to say like, this is a project that one person can take with like a smaller team and push farther. And so this was a project that I worked on primarily with a programmer trying to design a sense of space and place in an office that we didn't have, the client was not interested in building anything or spending a lot of money, but wanted to cover like thousands of square feet of um, corridors with a design. And so what we ended up doing was really just shining lights on these walls and then working extensively in the field after the installation of these lights in order to compose the project. And I think one of the things that became really apparent in this project, which I suspect is familiar to all of you, is like knowing when decisions have to be made. Some decisions must be made very early on. And then other decisions you not only can, but often should just postpone making them until as long as possible. And so it's trying to understand, you know, we knew that shining lights on walls might be cool. We didn't really know what this would look like. <laughs> but then we have to like take a, take a leap of faith that it's going to be all right. And then you get these unexpected moments that are really beautiful and artful, but don't, are not ab at all what you thought you were gonna start with at the end. And so giving yourself space to discover this and giving yourself like a team of people that you can constantly be working with and talking to who are as invested in you in seeing the final design, right? And giving everyone a space to have um, like a voice at the table, I think is key to the way that these projects come together. It's a good example of a small project that like Lane did on herself, on her own. You know, we have a team in each of these three cities that Alessandro mentioned, and we rely on each other for feedback, critical thought. Um, if the project is larger or requires a more nimble practice, we usually have two people 
per project of the core five. Um, one usually takes the lead. In some ways where we try to bucket trend, in many ways the clients are, tend to not want to buck trend, so they want the point of contact <laughs> to be the same person all the time. You need to know who to call when there's a problem. Exactly, and so, and so our it. structure tries to be resilient in that way. So uh, if one of us needs to go on vacation, the other person is there to, in, in like a traditional office setting. But that nimbleness comes in when we do something that we don't have any experience in. So uh, we were asked to do a lighting installation in this uh, residence, residential lobby uh, in San Francisco and nothing at this scale or what we had wanted to do was materially cast this like acrylic uh, arch or like um, I call it the Sailor Moon um, crescent thing. Um, and, and so here, you know, we relied on our array of colleagues and in this case, a fabricator to come on very early and join our organization in some way where contractually, and this is boring stuff, they were under our agreement with the client, right? And so all of a sudden we're held uh, liable for their work and we make sure that that's aligned in our vision, um, but that we can then hold kind of design decisions to be very internal and throughout the fabrication process. And so that was, you know, again, reinventing what our organization could be like um, per project. And you know, I, I think this example here uh, allowed us to navigate new realms um, of this process that we've now luckily and fortunately been commissioned to do a few others. Um, again, bringing in that same fabricator because we have that connection now and, and kind of understand how each other, uh, each other work. Um, and then maybe just our last quick one, in a more conventional way, you know, we also do a more conventional architectural practice. Um, this is a residence that uh, did come, came to us from a, an architect friend who works at another office, and what we find interesting, black here. What we find interesting in, in this project with respect to this conversation is that um, our friend had uh, this connection to do a renovation for a Park Avenue residence. She does not have insurance to do it herself. It's like fundamentally a tower architect's practice. She came to us with this idea that like, would you guys want the project? in a, some sort of loose collaboration where we fold her into the organization. She is under our umbrella uh, in, on an insurance level and that we carry the project through together. And so far it's been pretty fruitful. What's also interesting is that it's a co-op that, you know, if anyone knows, like really arduous has to get through. So if we can imagine these rings of influence, here we have a second architect being the co-op architect, their engineers that we're dealing with, but also uh, we, found issues of repair that we needed to go through. And so uh, expansion grows into engineers that we never had onboarded initially uh, and, and, and structural repairs that were never part of the scope. And so we're trying to consider this project as uh, equally nimble in a maybe more conventional way as opposed to some of the other projects. Um, and then just like, just quickly in closing, I think for us, uh, we have no idea how this collective grows in the future as projects get bigger, longer, as teams might get larger. Um, but I think what our collective likes to imagine is that we're all buying into that process of reinvention and having to figure it out, making mistakes, and um, knowing that each project kind of grows the collective in kind of like a very uh, informal but uh, in, in a familiar way. So that's it. I think that um, one thing that intrigued me um, about this um, ensemble of uh, practitioners is the fact that, you know, I, I really wanted to generate this, uh, th this uh, conversation around uh, labor, but um, also around this idea of uh, practicing collectively. And I think that Office of Things, um, uh, one way you guys cover that, uh, but in a sense, also a future expansion show that this idea of collaborating with you know these many different entities and 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 so um, and also you know w one thing that is uh, really dear to me as a topic is that all these like um, uh, Western white canons of architecture produced a very specific um, effect on the skilling the architectural workers so. 
uh, the object of criticism uh, that I framed the symposium from is uh, the Crystal Palace, that is really the epitome of this killing, is, is the beginning of a really, uh, uh, the skilling, the, the, the architectural worker for an industrialized way of producing efficiency and so on, which taps into this whole idea of uh, Beam and Revit that Emmeline was um, talking about in uh, one of the research uh, that she has, uh, which also folds into uh, the idea of the specification in architecture, what does it mean to specify and so on. So I think that this, um, this really is the embodiment of all this topic. So yeah, let's dive in. Are we allowed to have the, our own questions? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no, I really love the work. Um, and I was curious, I think when you, you brought up tolerance um, as a, I, 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 as a like question of material tolerance, but also I think like this nimble practice that um, you know, you, you're both mentioning and maybe it's like kind of a broader um, kind of uh, um, turn towards kind of um, seeing your peers not as, not as competitors, but as um, kind of, collective resources, um, like thinking about, I don't know, I'm just curious about like tolerance and, and kind of um, uh, around you as a practitioner, but also like, yeah, the, the kind of technical like material tolerances as a labor, like the question of labor specification was also super interesting as something that like is um, like, yeah, why isn't labor law for architecture like a valid <laughs> and actionable thing? So yeah, that's not much of a question, but more just terms. Well, uh, I don't know if this is a exactly a response, but maybe building on this question of tolerance, I think there's this weird aspect of architecture, which is that we sit and like provide a service, make drawings in a very traditional sense, and then someone does the actual labor of making the building. And I think Nick, you talked about this with the farm, like showing up, the show, seeing someone figure out how to actually build a thing and that there are a set of techniques w involved with this and there are a set of like best practices. And that is so much of the work that in a sense, I think maybe what you're getting at is like, how do we start to blur that boundary between the design and then the thing itself sitting completed in a field surrounded by other two acre lots? Right, yeah, I mean, I, these qu the questions of like, I mean, I think that's exactly right. It's like how as architects do we situate ourselves in this, we think we're so smart, we're, but there's this kind of, in, there's always the builder, the client, and then kind of us and the kind of classic three-part pyramid, which um, the, the, the question is very much like, what are the allowable interactions between these things? And then, and how do we make those things the most productive? Um, and we're, we've inherited in this country, you know, a very specific set of um, ways in which those things tend to function and they play out through the very mundane things that we think of as the kind of instruments of practice, you know, for every, which are essentially our drawings, the things we produce that Lane's referring to, to then someone else builds. Um, and so part of it's questioning that and then I think this, that for, for this question of tolerance for me has like always been like, that's one of the direct kind of ways outside of the contracts and everything that we very much interact with, our, that everything cannot be pinned back on those instruments of service. Like our own design decisions very much impact the, um, the lie, like not only the lives of the people in the field who, will, who are going to execute them, um, although it's certainly that, but, that, but also like, the, the contractors who are running, who are organizing that labor, because the con the general contractor is an organizer of a, a bunch of other trades, and so like it, like in things like this farm project or uh, really any project, you as an architect, I think you get you get to this point where you realize it's like if they're wasting time or they're doing things over again, they're losing money. Like they're like these people are not going to be, they're not they're going to come out of this job having lost money. Like and that's my fault. Like, how, how how can we work in ways? How can we 
design and draw in ways where, and that, that's kind of where I think tolerance comes in for me. It's like, wouldn't it be amazing if like all of our details, like the guy could be five inches off and it's still exactly right. You know, it's like, boom. Like that's a, that seems like a great design. Like that, like a, isn't, why isn't that a question for design, right? I think, I think our profession also offers us such a privilege to be able to speak and work with contractors. And often we get this, uh, especially in, in, a, in an academic setting where we often like disregard the role of the contractor or downplay their role in how to build something. And we come with an attitude that we're better than them. And, and, and then the, kind of the, oft, the oft made response is that um, you know, we're a part of this team and we gotta work together and, and like you're saying, it's costing them money to redo a detail. I often think about how um, this imagined world where we're tighter with the contractor or we are the design build office that, you know, there, that d exists out there in the world, that um, that relationship becomes not just more akin to one another, but uh, one where we can expand our own scope, right? Um, the Park Avenue residents had a huge issue where there were uh, structural issues that we had to repair, and that was not in our scope. Um, but what I found interesting there was once it got into that realm, they never asked the architect, us, to be involved. Like all of a sudden repair was not in our purview. And so repair became the contractor's uh, issue and his resolution with the co-op board and, and the client. And I thought that was so odd to me that because it's been titled this other type of design, uh, if you could call it that, that you know, all of a sudden I don't get a say in how it's done. And I think if we could place ourselves off of a pedestal and think of us as repairmen as well in many cases, especially if you're talking about like NYCHA housing, like all of those things, where we can get involved on a very ground and detailed level um, world, I think we become richer for it, and I think the community becomes richer for it as well. One of the things I try to keep in mind is like what what decisions really matter that I like I refuse to budge on and which things I will gladly give away to tolerance to like which things matter less and trying to like understand that everything falls in a spectrum of that. Right? And there's there's a couple of very big gestures that matter hugely and there's a whole lot that could still be negotiated and should be. I th and I think maybe to your point, I, a lot of the, these projects come as conversations, often with the client. Um, I think that uh, one of the earlier panels talked a lot about this is like, what does the client, what does the community have as input? So they're not seeing something for the first time and they're like, oh my God, you did this? <laughs> but really that they've seen it and they've had input to it and it's become a conversation and I think that that both eliminates the need to persuade, but it also means that you get other thoughtful people's um, perspectives. I think as long as you think that that makes a better project, I think you're in an okay place.
But that's, it's interesting too to think about it like down to the, because I guess I'm, I do think it's it's a nice connection to make to the like the lighting strategy is so smart. It's like okay, if we have this thing and we kind of know the capabilities, of this thing we put this thing in, then we'll adjust it to get the results in the field. Like I think that's a kind of perfect example of like clever tolerance in, employed in, into the thing in, within the constraints of a budget. Um, but it, you know, I guess the labor also trickles down all the way to like online, like to the to like, like it's labor and materials we kind of divide but of course there's the, you're bringing up the sort of labor involved in the production of the materials or like the labor you know the material itself is heavily labored right yeah no i i, th I think about to i mean tolerances are kind of i think the the like ability to be so off but also kind of exact is kind of an amazing place to be because if you think about salvage no two boards are alike right and there's this idea that um you can, you you know, you kind of have to be uh, in touch with the stockpile to be to to then start designing or something like this. And like, uh, there is a limitation also, like in terms of how many adobe bricks you can make at the Clean Soil Bank in Brooklyn, um, or like you know, just transportation. Mostly, it's it's kind of like also transportation. So I think there is that like a lot of background like material movement and also then cataloging what you have and figuring out like what you're going to do with it. Um, as part of this kind of, I guess, labor of working with materials that aren't standardized or have like quirks. Um, but I, I think one thing that was really interesting is a lot of people at the exhibition commented on the um, the precision of the shelves, which we you know designed up with these garage angles that we had bolted together with these pieces of scrap wood scrap from the wood shop um, that created the kind of um, shadow line um, and ability to like adjust the shelves between the bays that we had. And it was like a kind of crazy process. <laughs> we like had to dr drill press like the scrap multiple times to get it to like work and nothing. So it was kind of a funny, and the building was like the, the floor of the gallery is also like incredibly uneven. So like, you know, you can plan to an extent, but I think part of the experiment was also to live in that, live in that uncertainty. Um, and I, yeah, I, I also love to hear about like the um, the training of the builder through the project. I mean, that's also like a wild thing, which is kind of a, like, yeah, how does that play out? It hasn't worked out as well as we thought. Okay. <laughs> I, I, it has in a way. I mean, we, it's, I mean, the idea was that, yeah, we'd give him that, 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 that they could, their first project had, was, had been this dock that the client had already hired them to build. And, I mean, it could not have been simpler, an eight by eight square on the edge of the water. So like, that looks pretty good. Um, and then the, you know, and then we had them do the sauna and um, it was still, like I said, it was still, it's all, it's all wood construction. It's very simple, um, but it has, you know, it has, a, it's a gut, the sauna is the, fen the fence creates the kind of fence line with the cow pasture on one side and then it curves around to make the sauna. So it has these two curves in it. Um, and so that we knew that would be a challenge, and it was. And um, worked through it. We, he was still, um, you know, I mean, very serious about like the kind of questions of like, is it? It only makes sense if it's economically feasible. Like, so, is are you still in business after this? Like, you gave a price. Can we do this for the price? Like, that's the that at the end of the day, because you're gonna we need you to still be in business because we need you to do the house. Um, so you know, we were able, to, but you also don't want to bankrupt the client. So you're, you know. It's, it, it was a way of kind of getting us involved in that process. Like, in a really, it's like the stakes are very clear here. Um, so that it turned out fine. Um, you know, it took longer than it should have. That's the one thing we found is that the time, if you can get the time, you, you end up taking on more in a way. It's like, okay, you pause, do not spend any money, we'll figure this out, you know? Um, and then we'll come back to you with some ideas. Um, because you, we just don't, it's painful to, People, when the job would get really big, you know, they'd have to, they'd bring in, he'd like bring in subcontractors, like he'd bring in labor from a crew that he knew and from his former life in Virginia. He'd bring them up, he'd put them in the Airbnb locally, and, you know, they, they had like a week. That's what we budgeted. So you're just, it's like, the, you know, it's like the sands are going through the hourglass and every second is precious. And it's like, if they don't get what they were supposed to get done this week, they go back to Virginia. And it's very, you know, because that's what we budgeted. So, um, yeah, things have been, the process has been, it's been good in the sense that I think we, he's really, he's gotten a lot better. It's been very painful, him getting better. Um, and we've tried to, you know, make that not 
um, economically ruinous for the client. Um, so we'll see, but it, he's, it, 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 it's just been a tough process, but I think that's kind of what you accept, right? Like that these are, that they're just not gonna be smooth, that you have to, you, ha you know, you have to have the slack in your own processes to make it work. But you remind me that construction is hard. Like no one is happy when their house is under construction. It always takes longer. And there's always, it's always more complicated. But what I love about that is that, you know, in other words, I think to me, it sounds just like the, the contractors are part of future expansion, you know, for that sense. Like they're learning your aesthetic and how to build what you want. You're also making models for them to understand how you want things to be built. So um, if, if, you, if we loosen the terms with which we define our boundaries, like um, if you had another client in the same area, would you go back to that contractor after this project? Well, that, that is interesting. So one of, one of the things that we've hoped would happen has started happening, which is that the contractor now gets calls from very fancy architects um, saying, ah, oh, we saw you're doing this house, will you? And, but then they call me for a reference, uh, you know, and they say, hey, how's, how's it going? It's the future expansion school. And, <laughs> you know, so those are hard conversations. It turns out it's I, a longer school yeah. than you thought it was. Yeah. about thresholds and what you mentioned about instruments of practice. You mentioned that um, with some of your work you wanted to include these um, labor advocacy into written into um, contracts. Have you gotten an opportunity to do something like that? I'm curious about how you advocate for labor that other people are doing to build your projects, but also for your own, I think, labor? Um, how do you build in the time that you think will take to actually detail something in the manner that you would want it to be built, right? What the time that it takes you to do the drawing or uh, perhaps do a model instead of the drawing? You mean the, the labor inside of the office? Yeah. Um, I don't know, you, get, you do get better and better at that. I mean, we're, we're a six-person office, two partners and four employees. Um, we're, um, and I, I think the other, one of the other panels, like it came up just like kind of like what started, what caused you to start your own office or what was that process like? I mean, for us, I got really lucky. I, I my background, I did a liberal arts background. I came to architecture kind of late. Um, my partner had done like a five-year BARC at, um, at Cornell. She had known she was going to be an architect since seven. She said, "I can't understand that." You know, we and, um, and we, we was teasing each other because she she is like she can't believe I wasted so much of my life before I figured this out, and I can't believe she never read a novel in college. And um, but she, but it, but it really has worked for us in the sense that like when she by the time I was ready to take this on and start an architecture office together, she had been working at a high level for a long time. And she knew, I knew nothing about construction. I knew, I had, my office jobs were, I, I worked in the office for three years, I mostly did competitions, um, I quit, got licensed, and, but then it was like, I just had like an incredibly experienced architect join me. Um, and so that has helped a lot, you know, and, um, at least in the kind of feeling of, because when you start, you start with like a lot of naive energy, but you also, um, I think you learn to really value expertise very quickly mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so the, having that, at least that comfort that like we're not, that she knows how to design this correctly. I cannot screw it up because that she's gonna look at it and then she'll fix it. Um, that was huge, but then the, I think the, the labor is more about I don't know, just running an office is hard. It's not liberating in many ways. It's like you take on so much, like the fact that we can support ourselves through our practice, our two little kids, four employees, like it seems like an economic miracle to me. I'm still not sure exactly how it's we're all working, but um, it, you know, it, it does. And once you get it there, but it, it's a lot, you know, to have the responsibility for these employees, know that your kids' lives are on the line here, you know, all these things. Um, and that makes you be efficient, you know? It makes you, like, you have to figure that out. You cannot 
you lose a kind of luxury of like, well, as long as it takes, it takes. Like that's that's not the case. Like we have, we set schedules and we keep schedules. I think if we return to the question of, of expertise and labor, I think you know one logic behind the five of us starting an office together was that we came from five very diverse offices that are, you know are from very good architecture offices. And we all had specialties in different types of buildings and levels of skill sets. Um, and so we thought that you know, if we were to do a project, why couldn't we pool our knowledge and in the aggregate form an expertise? Right? None of us were experts enough to do a project alone, perhaps, or maybe struggled to. Uh, but in the aggregate, perhaps we could formulate one expert. <laughs> I mean, I think that takes, like, that takes a lot of humility and knowing it takes a lot of failing and messing up and hoping that like, it's not a critical failure and you'll move to fail again on something else. But like a lot of humility knowing to when you want to ask someone for help and when you want to reach out. Like we do this to the day, not just to this day, like not just within our office, but to friends, to fellow architects, to you all. Every, as soon as we get your email, I'll ask you for help. <laughs> the contracts that you're writing for your clients on the proposals, right? So you break down the projects in phases. But say, for example, if you have a project that you know it's going to be much heavier conversations with the contractor, do you then decide the, the CV phase is going to be very minimal? And then my CA phase, which you charge hourly, is going to be much heavier. You know, do you do those type of things or do you, like how, yeah, how do you negotiate that? I mean, I would say for any contract, we, if through experience, like over many, many projects and proposals, we do a worksheet that estimates how many hours each phase will take, right? Depending on the client relationship, the contractor on board, the complexity of, in our case, the architecture or the programming, like depending on what type of project it is. And we're trying to be as honest as we can about it. And then, that, you know, that's like the number that you want to hit, right? But in many cases, you know that that's not, not going to fly with a particular client or for whatever reason. And, you know, we scale back or scale up from there. It's a, like a position of being totally open, seeing where everything lays, and then kind of tactfully going in each one. I would say as like a, as a practitioner, and, and maybe the other practitioners here can, can also weigh in, even if your CA phase is heavier, charge more at the beginning because the project may close out <laughs> and get more of your fee. Yeah, always up front the fees. I mean, definitely. There's Concept design is very expensive. It, yeah, it totally should be. I mean, that's where you're providing the most value anyway. Um, but yeah, we tend to do monthly for CA um, and not hourly. Um, and we don't, this is an estimate. We say the contractor will tell you how long it's going to take to build the building, but this is how much per month it will cost us to be on site. Um, and so if the project doubles in length, we get paid we get paid monthly. You know, it's, it's known what we're going to get paid, but it's not our fault that it's gone wrong. It's the, it's the contractor's fault. Um, and so, I don't know, I think trying, those, these things are difficult, and you, it's totally true. You get what you, you decide. You know, we, we kind of sometimes think of it in three ways. It's like, are we going to make money on this project? Is this a client who is going to be really beneficial to us in the long run, even if the value isn't in this project? Or are we going to, is this project going to turn out? We think that the factors to produce like a really great design are there. And so if, um, and we'll get something that we can, that will be very valuable to our portfolio. If two of those three things seem likely to be yes, we'll take the job. If not the two, don't take the job. Um, I, I, no, I was going to ask. I oh, know I just was having a reflection on like question of value labor budgets and just thinking about exhibitions and like like you know usually kind of think about maxing out the budget what was surprising for the depot project is that we saved money and the it was it was really interesting actually speaking to scrap scrappers and folks working in this like secondary material economy of uh, re reuse recycling and they really don't see it as, as trash at all and in fact they were like if you give us the hardware back at the end of the exhibition we'll pay you um, or, or you could might, might recoup some money because you know the, the rate of copper or the rate of whatever it is and so it was just like somehow weirdly and you know because we were also looking at offcuts and like what we might do with them I think a lot of um, 
a lot of them were just given to us for free. I mean, so obviously like a very exceptional kind of pr project, but I'm, yeah, I don't know. I just felt shaken up by the idea that you could be under budget. Amelita, I was gonna ask you how you approach, maybe building on this question. It's like, how do you approach your labor within a research project? That is a great question. Um, it's, it's really hard to cap your time because it's one of those open-ended things, right? It's, but it's also like you don't want to let it kind of kind of bleed into endlessness so that you feel like you're just being, you're just giving a lot and, and not knowing what, what ha what's happening. You can't, you obviously can't pay yourself within an academic context because you're asked to do these things f just out of the sheer <laughs> uh, existence of in being in academia full time. And so there is, it's, it's like difficult. It's like, oh, this ratio you're meant to teach supposedly 60% and then 30% and then 10% service. So the research is 30%, but really that's like not true. There's a lot more teaching and there's a lot more service. And so then, but what I, I've been trying to do and still not perfect, but like doing like blocks or days where I can actually account for um, um, project work Versus, because I think it tends to blur and bleed into like all these other things and because it's like a melange, like the desktop is like kind of, uh, all the projects seem related to each other, but I try to discretize a little bit um, by the days and, and yeah, take a break, some kind of break on the weekend because I, yeah, I think the week weekends, I think this is also maybe a question about labor in academia and what it means, I wanna hear also from anybody who is also teaching alongside doing the thing that they love um, is, is it can feel extractive at some point. And so, yeah, finding just some sanity for yourself and some kind of accounting. But yeah, it's, it's different from like billable hours and like, yeah. Do your uh, illustration, does your illustration work fold into the same parameter? That is my parameter? side. Yeah, no, I get paid for that. <laughs> do, you, do you, gladly. Uh, do you Probably treat it differently in terms of time spent? Uh, because I imagine you can understand, like, kind of like how much time is going to be invested in X drawing. Actually, illustration is a lot more open to like actual commission, like funding than architecture in 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 academic settings. And I mean, I mean, like drawing, like in architects newspaper, for example, um, they they recognize the labor. They they give you more than you ask for, which is wild. And they're like. This, this is, a, you know, because this is the, the rate. This is the rate for illustrators. And so, you know, we, we often compare our profession to lawyers and doctors and, you know, why don't we get the same X, you know, and like illustration has been something eye-opening for me because also the time, that it's like not a time thing per se, but it's also an act of commitment. It's also like a kind of, there's a value that is like significantly higher than, I don't know, let's say um, the many hours that you might, uh, take going to a review, which somehow is not counted as labor at all. So I don't know where that ends, but I think it's very refreshing to step out of architecture and see what other fields are doing, other creative fields that may not appear to earn as much as architects, let's say. Sorry, it's a bit of a... It is interesting. I mean, I think that, like, um, because we're, if you think about the way that the... Yeah, as, a, as a business, right, you have the money that comes in and then you have the money that goes out. And at least on the, the inc on the revenue side and then the labor side, the, the pressure on the labor side from laws, uh, you know, minimum wage laws, minimum salary laws, all these things, the, the pressure is upward. The pressure on the income side is downward. It's enforced that there be competition. It is enforced that we not collude and say, well, I'll set a nice price that's a living wage for us as business people. There's no such thing as a minimum wage for an entrepreneur, right? Like, it's it, the, the, the pressures are one is down. The, the, it is in society's interest. They want us to charge as little as possible. It's not a policy to raise our cost. It's to lower it because we're seen as providing services to con consumers. So the consumer is the one that is cared about in the laws. And there's lots of great reasons for that, right? Um, but it sort of treats architecture as a nascent monopoly waiting to happen and to crush everyone with our, you know, it's like the Grangers versus the guys with the train. It's like, we, it's like we've got this giant locomotive and we're gonna cr crush the competition with it. Um, but so our pressure is always downward in what the money we can make and our costs are always, always upward. And 
Um, I think it's a strange predicament, but that's the kind of predicament of entrepreneurship. And I think it's so great to hear these kind of like, um, like Amon, like you're in, like, like the description of that kind of way of like the discovery of this waste stream economy, like this, one can start to fantasize about a whole other way of setting up an architecture practice that say that, that in a very entrepreneurial way, just said that you can care about all these things, but you could just reframe it as a business plan in which one can start to work through a whole nother set of realities in order to produce at the end of the day space, which is the thing that supposedly we all are trying to produce. Um, beautiful space, right, you know, that, that for people. Um, and so, uh, those are the moments I get like so excited. Or even like I think with you guys, A plus A plus A, like the way when you described the growth of the office, it was like, okay, our hope is that we'll all establish the kind of um, acceptable, you know, living wage that allows us to have some joy in our lives. And then um, and then we will just, as we think about adding employees, we'll just think, okay, so we need another one of those wages to give to that person, right? It's not like, that, yeah, it's just like, right? It's like a nice, simple formula. And um, it's going to involve a lot of entrepreneurship on your part to make that happen. But once you've cracked that, then there's like a, which I'm sure you will, the, you know, then, then there's a kind of way of thinking, of kind of resetting that um, calculus, which just is always driving the two numbers in opposite directions. Yeah, entrepreneur is not... No, I mean, I think that's the... the problem. We're still running. Like, yeah, I don't know. The rule set. yeah, No, but I think it is the way that I, like... I mean, to me, that's... Yeah, I think that's... I think that's the exciting moment. It's like, if we separate these terms a little bit, it's like, there's something... You know, there's a, something called a small business, and then there's something called a startup, and then there's something called an entrepreneur. And I think they all are a little bit different. It's like, the startup is... Um, which sometimes I think we wrongly aspire toward, like... They're, they're, the premise there is that there's going to be t three years of insanely unprofitable burning of money that is venture capital funded because the product that will come out of it will be so valuable that it, is, that it will compensate for that. And the system is set that, you know, if one out of every hundred it works out for the venture capitalists are covered, it's all fine. Like, we are never, uh, one would have to think about architecture as a kind of product, which plenty of people are you know, and it's not a bad thing to, to make that model make any sense. Because you're going to have to, at the end of the time burn, you're going to need the things generating so much capital to, to pay everyone back at their great rates. Like, then there's a kind of small business which has no real aspiration for growth, right? Like, I want to open a laundromat or something, right? Like, you just need to, you just, you kind of need the spreadsheet. You need to know how much you can charge. You need to know how much your, your costs are going to be. You need to get a neighborhood where, you can, where the rents hit the spreadsheet. And then there's the entrepreneur, which is something different. And the entrepreneur is trying to say, I think that there's a value out there that's kind of untapped. And I think that in the setup of the business that we could, um, we could tap into that value. We can be profitable enough to sustain ourselves and the employees. We can set healthy growth amounts, like, we, like all these things. One can map out the kind of lifespan of a practice in that way and say, these are the goals. For labor? Right. I think that's a great question. I think that's something we could do, uh, architects could do better. I think that's one of the things that, like, I hope Design Advocates does better. There's a great group. Um, uh, Peggy Deemer turned me on to this great group in Australia. Um, that they're they're a co they're a co big cooperative. But one of the things they do are doing is they're tr trying to make the more business for architects in general. So they have this incredibly well produced, very cute TV show that. Um, where they go interview architects and clients together, and, the, and they let the clients kind of talk about what a great process it was to work with the architects, how much value it brought to them, all these things, and they just broadcast it. On, it's like a show on TV. It's not one of these home building shows that we have that completely falsifies the labor. You know, it's like, you can get a great house in a month, like, and these two handsome people will build it for you. 
Like it's not, you know, it's not like that. And the, it's, it's a way of just saying, yeah, I think, that, I think the architectural value proposition is completely unknown at, the, at this moment in time. You know, I also think you've heard a few examples from the previous speakers about how engaging the community, telling people you're an architect, working with uh, your neighborhoods, in some ways is propagating your profession and your business or your entrepreneurship. So, and it grows in some ways that you don't expect, I think, like years on the line. It's, I think, something that we often think about in our office and we've talked about here on the side is like, this is a, like really a long marathon of a race, right? Like if you're thinking about the input and outputs of an immediate contact or an immediate project, it's probably the wrong way to think about it. And you've got to think about it many years out, many projects out, before you start to be able to like tie something together and see the fruits of some of the things that you're putting down now. I think part of that is because it's so slow, right? I mean, I'll see a friend and tell them what I'm working on and then see them two years later and I'm still working on the same thing. Hmm. And I still have the same sentence to say about it because it's, there was three years before that and there's like another three years and like things go so slowly. Um, which is not always bad. I mean, to maybe just drop the uh, Australia plug there. The <laughs> I think maybe the practices that you're talking about, like I'm thinking of Nightingale, which is, uh, speaking of collective and this nimble practices, um, grouping together expertise, they're, they're like social enterprise and that they're trying to change also ways in which we build like affordable housing and owner occupant like dwellings. They're on their like fourth, fifth project now, different architects taking on this model, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, and they have a lot of like visibility. Also like retain, repair, re reinvest is another one that's all trying, it's not so much about like entrepreneurializing the discipline or the profession uh, with new buildings, but it's about like caring for existing stock, repair and um, community investment. So, but they have like a big media following and that. So I, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, Interesting, I guess, like the entrepreneur is maybe not my my go-to word for <laughs> what I'd like to at least try to do in, in my own space, but there are a lot of like social enterprise-based practices that that bring come together, even if they're different um, practices. Our very extended timeline, and you know, like if I meet you in two years, you're still working on that project. But on the opposite, and you know, these are this conversation really uh, brought to the forefront certain questions that I uh, recently discussed in my seminar, and the question that construction is very slow, but then when when is about to uh, design and what the client is usually on the opposite side, that is always uh, very fast. It's, there is always this idea that we need to produce this specific project in a very limited amount of time. Uh, be besides the, you know, the, the limitation of that, uh, limitation in exploration and so on, and I think I, I I'm just going to comment a little bit overall also on this uh, uh, sort of uh, um, idea of uh, expertise and the fact that the architect is the, the person that, uh, you know, resolve things is quite a bit of, uh, you know, this Western white paradigm of like, so we, are, we, we, we would accept the fact that we are not perfect and then maybe altogether collaborative, we become expert on something. Um, but how do we how do we tackle this problem that it's often trickling down to our employees, for example? Like you have to put such and such on that project, and and schematic design needs to be done by this time because the client and 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 there is this always this pressure on the delivery because the delivery it was what makes us you know uh, efficient, uh, and that also. Um, trickles down on, on, on how do we quantify, uh, quantify the time, quantify the fee, um, opposing to this um, sort of a, a 
um, line that uh, efficiency is also what we do. So recently, um, this uh, all massive amount of use of Beam softwares, uh, particularly Revit, um, it, it's really creating um, a very big limitation in certain uh, design explorations and so on for, for the sake of efficiency, because we, we, we know that Revit is not necessarily a software through which you uh, design or explore, uh, but there is the problem of efficiency that is looming over uh, everyone. And I don't know, I just wanted to throw it there since that there were few I have, maybe picking up on one thing you mentioned, Alessandro, I have, I, I think that our work like has to be possible if everyone who works is paid and if everyone gets to go home before dinner and if no one has to work on weekends. Like if, if we can't do this, then we should change, then we are terrible entrepreneurs. We should change our practice. We're not charging enough. Like something fundamentally must change if you cannot do that. Um, I think we've, many of us have worked at practices that don't believe that. And I, th I don't think that the work is better for that kind of environment. Yeah, that's, what, that's what Richie so. said, right? Like he left the offices to start his own because he felt exploited. Yeah, and they do fantastic work. Like you can, you can go home when it's still daylight for most of the year. Yeah. Like I feel, I feel so, I feel, <laughs> I feel so strongly about this. I mean, an anecdotally, like the hardest thing we've done in the past year was how to figure out the, the pay structure for our employees. Like that was a tremendous amount of reading other larger offices and office handbooks and just like trying to understand where these offices are, how are these offices are approaching uh, the structure of their office, how they pay their employees, what benefits, all these things. It was just like such a crash course for us uh, to be able to grow and, and it's like a part of that you know, yeah. entrepreneurship. But then, sorry, Jerome, I know you have a thing. You go. I saw you. <laughs> um, I think the other thing about like thinking about like how do you actually do that? Um, because there are deliverables, there are expectations, there are clients who are like, hey, I'm paying you a lot of money. And you're thinking, well, this is very small <laughs> compared to the rest of the project. <laughs> but they want their they want to see something immediately and soon. And so one of the things that we try to do is to be open about the schedule with our team. And so then you work backwards. You say, look, we have to present something by this date. What is reasonable to get to and then back into that? And if you can't make fancy diagrams, and if it's more about conversation, then that's fine. And so then it's like a conversation among the team about what we're going to deliver and how we're going to present it that meets the schedule rather than saying, okay, well, we have a deadline, and now you're going to have to cancel your plans this weekend. <laughs> so it's like... Yes. We might lose a few projects, but like that's fine. We have the agency. We can do it. We should all do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, sort of pick up on some of this. I think of all three of the panels, there's kind of multiple conversations happening at the same time. And I, I mean, I think in some ways, you know, I want to commend the the work of the, of this panel uh, and and think about it in the context of the other three, in the sense that you know, if you think about, you know, all three of the practices in some ways presented quite different, put some quite different ideas on the table, and I feel like it's not going to, you know, this isn't something, you know, I think you can be a good entrepreneur. And I think we, but I think we can, I think you, you three are also sort of rethinking a client sort of relationship. Like I, I love sort of the way, Nick, you're talking about this kind of farmer guy, right? And also then, and, and then the sort of training of the contractor. And of course, like I'm sure there's a ton of anecdotes that go along with this that are really maybe like whatever, but 
I just think that I think that we do need to really continually question what it is we're trying to do. And like you said, like we're trying to make beautiful space. Sure, but that is inherently political, right? And you know, and so I I just think that there's and I love the kind of Home Depot sort of sort of work. And I just I think that you know, it's not like we all have to put on necessarily this like activist or nonprofit hat and go change the world. And I do think that there, you know, I, I want to take more seriously what the three of you are doing, what the three practices are doing in terms of even re flipping potentially some of these client service provider ideas, right? Like what would it mean to start to almost cultivate clients, which is kind of what you're, you're doing, really all three of you in different ways, uh, and really think about a, a different, again, what it, it is that we do. Uh, and what it is that it means to be an entrepreneur vis-a-vis -vis what we do. And also be an entrepreneur. I love how you described, <laughs> how you described the term. Because if we, again, if we were maybe in a different school or department, when I hear entrepreneur, I think like, I'm going out, and, and, and this is back to my comment, which I want to qualify from last panel. You know, that the, the sole pursuit of not only my degree in school, but then what I go to do is to accumulate as much money as possible. Right? But I love how you sort of said, no, you know, maybe being an entrepreneur is finding a sustainable model that um, allows me to do these different things, right? Or, or, or cultivates a, a client landscape that allows for us to do these different things, right? And maybe grow a little bit. So I, I, just think th I just think there's ways to sort of think about this landscape, especially in a rural context, that could really, you know, set us 30 years further and think about who are not the clients, who are people who are not our clients, who could be and should be. Uh, yeah. I really love the, oh, are we allowed to? I, I just wanted to say on that on that note, uh, that's really, I, th I think that, that that's an interesting question. We don't all have to be answering the same question at the same time and doing everything. Like I think if, like the conversation about material banks right now is also changing the client landscape as to like looking for other kinds of materials to, to um, you know, that are uh, culturally acceptable, socially acceptable in, in the, the kind of, um, you know, idea of like, oh, I'm hiring an architect to, to design something. Um, so like what, what might it mean to create different kinds of networks or, or um, uh, yeah, supply chain relationships with, with people that not everyone has to carve out their own you know, relationship with the granite broker or something like this, but there's a sharing that, that happens that maybe other people are dealing with other things. And so, yeah, I think that's a really spot on comment. Emily, I think it sounds like you're also getting at this, like, expansion of the architect's expertise beyond designing a, like, specific, beyond, like, saying how to build a stud wall and, like, some detailed drawings and understanding, like, how you waterproof the bathroom or whatever, and into finding the materials that will become the the, the object at the end. And it's the, I think that this expansion of the expertise is something that is bucking the trend. A lot of architecture is more about specialization now, where you get a mechanical engineer and an electrical engineer and like get a like a spec writer, you get a structural engineer, you get someone to come in and do the lighting design, you get someone to come in and design, design the kitchens, and like you can quickly start to take the scope of the architect's design and start to meet it out to different professions that are all specialists. And so then the architect becomes kind of this glue that sits between a bunch of other stuff. And so it's really interesting to me to see that you found a place where you could actually expand that. Instead of giving it away, you like go, go take another piece of like the rest of the world and you add it to our, our field. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. Um, if I could just follow up on the last question. Um, one thing I think that was maybe missing from all your presentations for me was your understanding your relationship to each other and other uh, architects' offices practicing in the same place at the same time as you, um, either through like informal conversation between you or in your relationship to 
the profession as something that is has like regulation and related to like national regulatory frameworks and whether that might trouble the conceit of the entrepreneur as a way to define ourselves as architects. Um, I don't know if you have anything to As say. a professionalization? Yeah, like if you're going to talk about creating value for our work, for the work of the architect, is that related to all architects? It related to the title of architect? Is that like legally something to be discussed? Le you mean in in, when you say, what are the regulations that you're thinking of that might, that might prevent that conversation? Like the, the licensing of an architect and um, the discipline as a profession, which is not similar to entrepreneurship and that everybody is kind of bound to a code. And oh, right, yeah. I mean, there is a movement, I mean, the professionalization thing is, there's a lot of conversation around whether that's a good thing and, or, or not, um, the, and whether it does for that very reason. Um, but people, I, you know, I've, I've, I'm not an expert on this, but I've read essays about it, about how you know, there, was, there was time, Ralph Nader, for example, you know, these people really pushed hard to get rid of the idea of professionals in general because it limits competition, it's anti-entrepreneurial. Someone has a great idea from a house for a house. They can't bring that idea to the market because they've got to go do three years of school, three years, you know, right? It's like it's 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 a gate. It's a it, it's gatekeeping, um, and it's protectionist in that in that way. Um, but we're you guys are already on that track. I mean, we're you know we're all we're it's the kind of system we're 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 stuck with. And I think there's I I don't know. I mean, listen to Jerome talk, and I think he's painting a beautiful picture of a kind of. Um, really progressive entrepreneurialism for architecture um, that in, in that telling it seems to me it's a kind of invention at the at the you know really a way to kind of bring per personal things to market more effectively in ways that both satisfy your own set of values but also can be profitable um, I think that's definitely one approach I I fantasize about that but I also fantasize about the opposite in which collectively, yes, we make a case for architecture much more strongly and the value of it can rise to the, you know, to in the same way that it's obvious why lawyers get paid more. You, I mean, you can't, if you're in legal jeopardy, you're you're weighing the, I I'm gonna spend, go to jail, I'm gonna lose something, I, I, I'll pay whatever this guy says to keep me, you know, away from these terrible outcomes. The value proposition is incredibly clear. Um, so I think it's a kind of unfair, you know, thing to compare us to. I know we do it to ourselves all the time, but um, I, th I think there are other ways that it is. It has become very confusing about what is the value proposition of architecture societally, and um, we could all work together to on that problem. I think it's also squishy, right? I mean, on some level, we go to school and we spend hours working and trying and testing things and starting over, and then going back again and starting over again, and like it's all in the name of good design, and that's such a nebulous term. <laughs> and that's a nebulous term, not just inside of like an architecture school, but also in like in society at large. And I think one of the things that I loved about seeing the public interventions in this morning's panels is that these are these opportunities where talented and thoughtful architects through many, many avenues bring thoughtful design to our public spaces, which is something that in this country there is a serious lack of. And we don't value the public spaces if they're not designed well, if they're all these like sad, modernist, windy, sunny or shady at the wrong times of day spaces. And so then you try to find ways to make good design out of public spaces. And to me, it's in hope that at least like one person stops and says, ah, my environment, what a nice place. And maybe if, if one person does that each time you install something, you know, in a courtyard or in a plaza or an intersection, then maybe you, we can have this broader appreciation for our public space and for also the thoughtful design of that. I don't know if that... Well, maybe I'll add, too. I mean, that makes me think that, like, 
because we're often trying to be our our own. The thing we do, people are always trying to make us obsolete. Like we work in some sense, right? Is trying to productize architecture and take our office design away from architects. Yeah, I know. Well, we've, we've outlasted. We work. Yeah, we beat them. <laughs> we got them. <laughs> um, but you know, there, 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 it's it. You know, there are people trying to make modular home products. There, you know, there is this kind of constant idea that there's something wrong with the way that we do it, and that it should be done more efficient. That efficiency is a problem. Um, I, I, I think that's. I think it. You know, while efficiency is something we have to grapple with, I think it's. I think it's something we also resist all the time. That somehow the idea of efficiency is like the thing, um, is. You know, it's really tricky because it just leads to, you know, that's how our phone was sold to us. You know, all these things are sold to us is they'll make your life better, everything's going to become more efficient, and we find ourselves more and more frazzled at the end of the day. And so clearly it's not doesn't work. There, you know, I read a study once that showed that the cars, every time in uh, gas-powered cars, you know, every time an innovation was made in engines, there's an option to either make the engine, either that innovation could go to make it more fuel efficient or more horsepower. And they always go to more horsepower, regardless, you know? And it just so they can sell, even though we don't use it, no one needs 450 horsepower. But previously, all those innovations were going to the horsepower. And that's always how efficiency works. We, will, we build more highways to take, decrease the traffic. What are you going to get? More car traffic. You know, it's not, it always works that way. So I think we're, I think as architects, we're always, I think part of our resistance, the, the positive societal resistance, is trying to frame other forms of value that are not efficiency, like that are other things. That doesn't absolve us from being good um, entrepreneurs, but, you know. Um, uh, I had another question. Um, first of all, I mean, these conversations are amazing. I'm eight years out of school, and just wanting to have these kinds of types of conversations with anybody it's really hard to find just being like um, transparent with your business model, your fees, uh, your practice, and everything is really wonderful. So props to whoever put this together. It's completely amazing. Um, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a question, maybe not specifically to your guys' panel, but maybe to everyone here. Uh, for example, a uh, person here from WIP, uh, work, in pro uh, work in Progress. Um, um, what I noticed a lot in these projects um, is the topic of collaboration, collectiveness, uh, bringing in other designers to help you fulfill a project. Um, uh, I guess my question is, what is your guys' take on giving credit uh, to those collaborators and and acknowledging that in fact you weren't the only one on the project, and I say that only because you know even a simple diagram from Office of Things, you know, putting your five partners, even putting the other people up behind it, just acknowledging the name is for me that's very like respectful in a way in our career that is very egotistical sometimes, and it's just me, 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 you know. Um, and then when you brought up the project of like the, the apartment, uh, acknowledging the fact that somebody came to you, uh, even uh, for the Office of Things, and was like someone came to you who didn't have the expertise and was willing to collaborate. And just the fact that you merely um, acknowledged that, right? And it wasn't a Office of Things project. It was the fact that somebody came to you for your expertise and your, in your collaboration. Um, what is your guys' opinion just, I guess, in architecture as a whole, on giving uh, uh, credit to those who help you, especially now that we're also talking about labor. I mean, giving credit, there is a, that is labor. It's labor into the design you put in your hours, you know, things like that. So I just wanted to speak to that. Um, y yes, give credit. Uh, but maybe in a roundabout way, I, I, I've had this thought recently. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us came from practices that um, worked with a, uh, an architect who would often hire an AOR, right, architect of record, to stamp your drawings, right? And you would act as a designer, but you know, the, credit, the credits that you would have in publications as a result of this relationship would always be hi hierarchical. There is the designer architect, and then there's the executive architect. And you'll see that for every high rise in the city, like without a doubt. Um, 
and, and maybe this pertains differently to us because we haven't done a Skyrise, but I think for us, when we come into a project with a collaborator, we bring in a sense of humility to say that we don't know all the answers, neither do you. Let's work together on some you know, level ground. And that credit is given because we believe that uh, through this process, we'll come up with a better project and you know, that the hierarchy is actually fluid. Like in one sense, uh, partner A might be taking the lead in another month, someone else might. Right, and so if that's the case for every project, then why wouldn't the credit be given equally? Um, and I think that might be changing. I don't know. I feel like I see our contemporaries getting projects published. Um, whether or not who is stamping what, I think the terms of collaboration and collectivity are more used now than perhaps they were in the past. And I, it's something that we talked about often as people who do stamp drawings, right? Like, um, I don't think we'd ever take on a project where it wouldn't be collaborative. We, it's, it's also, it's hard, right? Because you want to try to get, as you, you want to try to get credit for the things that you do. But you also, I think it is important, and we try to check ourselves and talk about this often, right? It's important to always remember that you didn't do this by yourself. No architecture project comes together by yourself. Um, I think of, I think of like movie credits as a analog, and I make every time I go to the movies with Ken, I make him sit through all of them, <laughs> because it's like twenty minutes of watching names go by, because these are all the people who go into making a movie, and sure their names are small and they go by quickly, but there are like thousands of them, and this this is true for architecture too, right? And that's, you, there's like, there's contractors, there's consultants, there's people who help with like the early phases, the later phases, they're like, they're press agents, there's like all this other stuff that goes on. And there's the film credit is interesting because they're all unionized too, right? So each of these different maybe, maybe the architect of, should unionize. Each of these sectors of labor, you know, cinematographers, visual artists, I guess are trying to become more unionized, but that might be an interesting analogy for, for our field. And that reminds me, was, uh, to give credit to my friend Jacob Rydell, who runs the professional practice um, sequence at Harvard GSD, um, he, sa he, told, he said in a forum the other day um, that that's how they should do architecture awards, should be like the Oscars, you know, where you give out the best lighting designer on the project, you know, and just like, to, they could do essentially that. Essentially, it's take the movie credit, just say, you know, these are it's a team, out here, are the, here are the 30 projects, and let's just... Think about them as team efforts, and it's like, what are the equivalents of those things? Because it's it's obviously true, you know, that much goes into a project, and um, the parts have to come together in the right way to make it successful. I mean, I, I do just want to add that maybe also thinking about it not so much as you have the vision and you're getting people to help you with the vision, but it's more like also a person, like what, like collaboration is this thing we're like, oh, just throw it around, but actually it's like kind of ways of working with other people with also like coalitions, different people with different interests, but share a moment in a project that everyone has a, a kind of a vested interest and like they see themselves in it too. Um, so we, yeah, like every project website, we try to do a bit of the movie credits a little bit, <laughs> like all the TAs, all the RAs. Um, and I think that's, yeah, it's it's also like, you know, when you go out to, to um, uh, we tried to do a supply supplier directory also with the direct connection of people who would like to be connected. If you want 18th century barnyard floorboards, please go to the website and you'll find them directly. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's, yeah, credit, yes. Um, I think this will be the last question I have, but hopefully it's a good one to end on. Um, I think with the idea of labor, something that I've been thinking about with um, something that's always come up in, I guess, creative practice is um, non-productive time. So like, how do you account for, um, how one of my professors once put it is like, you spend most of your time, you have to give yourself more time to do like design work because most of the time it's like, you're like not even, you don't know what you're gonna do and you're trying to just figure out what you're even gonna do and that takes up like the bulk of that time of like design and um, 
I guess there's like also a sort of like pressure or expectation surrounding it and um, like for instance right now I am we're like maybe a few weeks from finals and the only thing that I've made so far is a, like a little three panel comic that I've drawn for my project yes um, so and I think for me there's like a certain pressure that like oh like I need to produce a certain amount or that like there's expectations and then what happens when you don't meet those expectations and I think that also comes into like labor where it's like you want to be able to give yourself more time to do things but then at the same time you don't want to be keeping yourself up at like weekends and holidays and so on so I guess how do you account for like non-productive time or like when things don't go your way I think that's a really interesting question. And one thing that for me has become helpful in thinking about like the the nonlinear process of like brain thought into a project is trying to think through drawings and to think through models and to think through like things rather rather than thinking through thoughts inside your brain. So that the non-productive time is productive, it's just not linear, right? And at the end you have at least a bunch of sketches. And to stop thinking about like, this is my sketch drawing, my draft drawing, when it's two weeks before finals, I'll start my final drawing, right? The draft drawing is the final drawing, it's just like part way through. I found this um, book at the library recently, it's a book of Piranesi prints. And one of the things that's really beautiful about it is that some of the pages on one, on the left side of the um, fold, you'll have the first pressing. And on the right side, you'll have the second pressing. And you'll see basically a drawing that of like some columns, some arches, some like whatever ruinous dark things. And then you'll see that he added and imp like worked further on the plate. And so you see the traces of the earlier drawing underneath the later drawing. And they are, though they're two final and beautiful objects in some sense, they're also like they grow out of each other. And this they, it has a trace of its former former self as a drawing. So you don't, you're not like drawing in pencil sketching or thinking about it and then trying to make a plate. 
you're working through the drawing itself. And I think that's I think that's a helpful way to think through things, but also to be to have something at the end. I mean, I also think about my work at all hours of the day. <laughs> if, if I can, as someone that didn't graduate that long ago, um, I was pretty rebellious against getting licensed and going through the process of getting licensed because I thought, you know, I went to school for such a long time, I should have the knowledge to actually start a practice and do this. But then I decided, you know, I actually need the knowledge to do this. <laughs> so I started the process of studying for getting accredited and realized a lot of these questions that are coming up of like, how do you bill? How do you account for time that is, as you mentioned, uh, non-productive within like the building of a practice? It's actually information that, is written within those like books that you need to study for for your exams, like the non-billable versus the billable. You always charge three times the amount because you know that the amount of time that you know it takes to design and like create and stuff, like it's productive time ultimately, and it takes care of uh, that. But I think that you know if you are thinking about whether becoming an architect or not. Just for the sake of being a person that likes to learn and likes to be informed and likes to have a seat at the table, just look at the information. It's from, from someone that like was uh, for many years not wanting to be accredited and not wanting to take the exams. You don't even need to take the exams to know like these things, right? You, you can just read them. Don't be, don't be afraid of the exams. Yeah. They're not. No. They're, they're also, they're not hard. I, didn't I know did. That. I took. I I took one a week. Just I just I in between jobs took six weeks off. Took studied. Took I passed them all. They're not hard. Yeah. They're I, not I failed hard. many times. Well, but that you were. Yeah, probably, but you were. Were you working when you took them? Yeah. Yeah. See, don't work when you take, find enough. six weeks and you don't have anything to do. Just get them done with, and then you'll never think about them again. It's impossible to do it while you're working. It's it's, it's, it's also hard, easier when you're young, for sure. That's the thing. Um. Right. Uh, I think um, I think we are basically at the end of this uh, incredible day uh, of uh, conversations. Um, I I actually ha would like to ask um, to um, Andrea, Nick, and Jerome, um, and Brown into maybe. Yeah, I, I, wrapping up, um, <laughs> I think that, um, I think these three sessions really are the embodiment of uh, um, what um, our um, idea of rethinking practice is. Um, we had so many conversation uh, in the context of my seminar, but we have this conversation constantly in studio. Um, and sometimes these conversations are very abstract. Uh, today, they became really materialized in front of us uh, through the work of these amazing practitioners, uh, but also um, through their work through academia, we can see that uh, it was really in the air to uh, 
to hear how the practice is intertwined with this system of education and uh, pedagogical lines, and um, and we we heard it. There is, there are many things that needs to change, and 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 these are mutually going towards each other into the space of practice, but into the space of the uh, uh, the, the academic space. Um, we, we talk about studio and how studio is set up. Studio comes from uh, the Beaux-Arts school and with this idea that uh, there, is a, there is the artist and the artist has many assistant and that's where uh, the problem of all these like many long nights in studio are promoted is through, through, through this system of very uh, white Western ideal of the master and the artist. Um, so th there is, um, we have seen so many alternatives today. So um, to, to the ones that are students and they are about to graduate maybe next spring or some, someone else in the summer. Um, so you, you can look up onto all these conversations, rethink about all this conversation and think about what you are willing to do and what is your balance and what are uh, your value, or what do you value in, in our profession? And I think that's uh, a little bit the lesson uh, that we learned today, um, besides like literally the fantastic work that each office is uh, producing. Um, at the end um, of this day, I also want to, um, to thanks again all the participants for your for sharing your incredible work for fostering this conversation i want to thank all the students that participated um, and people that came from outside of course um, <coughs> and a um, few sp special thanks um, i have to thank dean hake for the fruitful conversation around this symposium that started back in may um, Everyone involved in the organization of the symposium, uh, Barjan Polman for the early work on this, um, Kendra Seitz that is here, and she's the director of uh, uh, internal exhibition and events that was uh, an invaluable collaborator, attentive in very meticulous uh, details. Uh, Stefan Bodeker for his support, um, and then I would like to thank um, uh, McLean Reagan, um, which is part of an office called Mediums of Design, uh, newly formed out of last fall 2022 um, professional practice force. Uh, and now is an office together with uh, Zina, Saba, and Nicholas Nekedov. Um, <coughs> and then uh, I would like to thank um, uh, and, and also, uh, yeah, uh, I, I give credit to Megan and, and her office uh, to help with the chronogram drawing that we um, presented at the beginning. Mario Gooden, uh, the director of the MARC, for the many conversations we had about practice and how to change practice, and, and especially in the pedagogical uh, space. And then uh, my, my partner, Rick Rob Rosborough, uh, with whom I lead architension for always engaging in a critical conversation and to be hard on me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all.